His peers voted Adams Young Player of the Year. Few outside this room knew Adams the Drunk, and none of those inside would have noticed the problem. This was an era of big drinkers. After four pints and six brandies, he'd negotiated the stairs, but fell at the next hurdle. It's Tony Adams on the award, but I'd like to say thank you to uh, my teammates, uh, John Lukic, Viv Anderson, I'm going to mention them all by the way, sorry about that. Viv Anderson, Dave O'Leary, Kenny Sampson. Uh... <laughs> all right, all right, steady. Um, uh, Martin Hayes and all the rest of the lads, thank you very much, cheers. Okay. I mean, Tony, probably one of the youngest captains in Arsenal's history at 21. He was a leader then, he was always a leader. And um, it just naturally followed that uh, he would be the next captain and it just took to it so easily. By spring 1989, it looked possible that Arsenal could win the league championship trophy. Only Liverpool stood between them and the silverware. Tony Adams was riding high, but in private, he was falling about and apart. An unbelievable climax to the league season. Tony was ahead of that success and he was lifting up trophies, you know, 21, 22 years of age. I mean, he must have thought, this is, this is easy, this career, this is, this is simple. Here am I, the youngest captain ever uh, in Arsenal's history, picking up these wonderful trophies. Hey, this, could, this should go on for the next 10, 15 years. Enormous jubilation, enormous feeling of joy. So suppress it all with alcohol, because that's what you do. When the cheering ended, Tony Adams was left with a void that only drink could fill. Woke up the next day, the Saturday, hung over and pretty lonely actually. And if I if I'd stopped to feel the loneliness for two minutes, but I didn't. I just rounded up a few guys because we needed to celebrate and got drunk all day Saturday. And then uh, got a cab late about four o'clock in the morning um, to Highbury and slept on the marble stairs outside the Grand before we prayed the cup in the morning. I was the first one there with the. Uh, the guy that opened up the stadium, Paddy Gallagher, and uh, he opened up, yeah, it's, uh, congratulations. Adams joined his teammates to tour the streets of North London in celebratory mood. Cheering fans threw him cans of beer. Oh, absolutely ecstatic. Really delighted for the players who have worked very hard. Delighted for the fans. It was the Scottish manager's finest hour. Graham had played for Arsenal two decades earlier and gave his young team a sense of history. He was a disciplinarian, who'd make Arsenal great again. The squad dubbed him Gaddafi. I think in, in every walk of life, whether it's sport or, or business, there's got to be an element of fear that people say, right, if we, uh, the boss has walked in, oh, oh, are we all working to maximum? Are we all near? Are we all, you know, behaving ourselves? Now, if there's no fear, then you get um, people doing their own thing. You get a bit of anarchy, you know, about the place. See, I was very frightened of my boss. And um, I used to drink on that one. I used to keep the anger down because I was afraid of it. Because I was afraid if I didn't drink on that one, I would hit him. I wouldn't have liked to think it'd have hit me because I think it'd have, whew, it was too big for me. <laughs> uh, no, far too big, there's no way I'd hit him back. <laughs> I was very scared of him. I couldn't confront him. I couldn't ass assert myself. I used. The anger he gave me was my own anger and threw it out at the other boys. And uh, I never stood up to him on any issues. Put a lot of pressure on players um, verbally um, and with his presence, he did have a very, very big aura about him, but in a way that was, he was domineering. Um, but that's the way he managed and that's the way he moulded a team of, of, of kids really into to winning the championship twice. and and having the success he did. Graham was a remote figure and liked it that way. Adams was his voice, and it suited both of them that much of the team building took place at the bar. My way of bonding with uh, the team of the pass would be to take them down the pub and get them drunk and uh, to try to get some of their true feelings out. We used to go out now and again for a drink after training on a Tuesday, there was a, uh, a little 
gang of players who, because we worked really hard under George and, and um, Monday, Tuesday was two really hard days, especially Tuesday. And then we had the Wednesday off. Some of them went home at five, uh, back to their wives and families, so I couldn't really understand. Some stayed toe to toe all night uh, and ended up the gutter with me. I'd be getting home at threes and fours in the morning. and But that was general. And I think, I mean, on a, in a, a Tuesday in we, we we'd meet Spurs players and QPR and everybody else. The manager demanded a professional approach to play on and off the pitch. The drinkers on the squad resorted to old tricks to hide their boozing. You'd get the old wet tops on and you'd be out there on the pitch or the, or the bin bags, wherever it was, and you'd sweat it out. And you would really work and punish your body and what you thought was sweating out the alcohol and getting rid of it all through your system. We banned that a few years ago where our players would put a bin bag on to try and sweat out the night before. A lot of players used to do it to try and reduce their weight. And they'd wear a bin line underneath their training kit. We wouldn't know they were doing it because it'd be underneath their kit. So they'd go into the toilet, put it on, put their kit on. When they're coming from training, go into the toilet, rip it off and throw it in the bin. Adams learned to time his drinking bouts to stay sober for matches. But he miscalculated at Swindon and Everton. I was drunk, um, it, 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 you know, night before, and I got up on the day of the game, and I recall still feeling a bit wobbly, feeling a bit shaky, and uh, I had uh, uh, one for the road, as we used to say, uh, but it was more in desperation because I was thinking maybe this might help settle me down a bit, because I knew I was never going to sober up in time. As I recall, I think we were all having a bit of a laugh and a joke about it, and, um, and Tone was laughing and joking. Uh, and the gaffer didn't know. Or if he did know, he didn't say. Um, and it'd be interesting if he, if he had known, would he have said anything? I don't know. Against Sheffield United, he was over the limit and was still made man of the match. Could we have won a lot more trophies? I mean, that's the sad thing about it, you know? I mean, we did win a lot, six, six and eight years, major trophies in eight years. And I mean, that's with him and, and Paul Merson. Towards the end, they weren't drinking like that. I, I don't believe it. They couldn't have done. And I got on, I remember playing at Luton. I was well drunk. Yeah, at Luton, I run down the wing, there was no one near me, I fell over the ball. It's January, and Adams is touring health farms. His charity will tailor therapy to individual athletes battling a variety of addictions, and finding the right environment for treatment is essential. So what sort of people come here apart from footballers like yourself? Uh, uh, who comes here? I think anybody and everybody. I think uh, um, people that want to uh, chill out, um, there's numerous things that they offer here. Um, massage, um, there's a pool, I think uh, we're going to see a few things. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Uh, ah, you can look at this. <laughs> it looks like uh, one of those vibrating beds, doesn't it? Sorry, have we? He's there. Sorry, we've got to get out of here. Specialists. Peaceful. Would this really be ideal for your purposes then, being able to send someone to a place like this? I think there's everything that I need here. You know, I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm not a, you know, but in my judgment, in my judgment, there's a tennis court there, there's a swimming pool there, there's a lake and there's a peaceful environment. Um, there's good food, there's nutritionists, there's, you know, great people that I love and trust in, in the therapists and the, and the counsellors and the families can come at weekends and, and chill out. Nothing, no one's going to be out of place here. No one's going to know that they're here. No one's going to know that um, what they're here for. And it just creates a lovely environment. If someone wants to get well, then they possibly can here. If, if, if the charity had enough money, would you be interested in setting up a, a, a place like this? Big grounds, big house? No, I think it's got Where's drawbacks. I think, I think you, you've got the Betty Ford Clinic. No disrespect, they've got people clean and sober and they've done their stuff for years and the Priory have as well. You know, I'm not taking nothing away. It's just in my judgment that I feel 
that this environment constitutes a better place for people to get well. I'd shift them around, you know, as well. I think I don't think I wanted to be in one uh, one kind of uh, area. Right. You know, and it seems silly to bring a, a, a player from the Midlands, for instance, or a person, you know, uh, from the Midlands all the way down south um, to here when he's family, you know, I'm looking at family therapy and, and things like that. Back in 1990, Adams could have used some peace and quiet. After an own goal against Manchester United and some lacklustre games for England, he was suffering the taunts of hostile elements in the crowd and the press. The donkey noises and the showers of carrots caused anguish that led to yet more drinking. We went to this pub that I knew and we drank all night and then we drove home and we went in, he stayed on the sofa bed and that morning a girlfriend brought the papers up and he had Eeyore everywhere and everything and he had the donkey's ear holes, that's when it first came out, the donkey one. And I, I didn't take the papers down to him, I wish I did now because he pissed my sofa bed. Weed all over the sofa bed. That was his party trick. He couldn't stop weeing beds. I wasn't particularly liked throughout the country. You know, the donkey label was there. You know, I had that pretty much everywhere I went. I lived in a West Ham area, and I got that at the school. I got that everywhere, and it was another reason why. I, another reason why I drank. I drank, but it was another reason I. I couldn't handle that, so I drank more. And I think we played West Ham not not long after that away. Uh, he took several abuse but he never seemed to trouble him. It fueled me with resentment and with retaliation, and my retaliation to do well at football. I thought if I proved myself at doing my job well, then the rest of the world would accept me. You know, if I thought that I'd be number one, that I'd win that, I didn't realise what I was doing to myself, but I thought I could have the last laugh on everybody else. The season over, Adams was laughing, but the joke was about to wear thin. The day he was to leave Britain to tour the Far East with Arsenal, he went on a bender, one he'd never forget. My season's ended, you know, active alcoholic, you, you kind of, I'm drinking, you know, football's done. It doesn't constitute as sobering up for, I suppose, or getting myself together for, because tours are tours and it was kind of a justified time to drink. And I know I've got a 13 hour flight and if I let that one come up anyway, I'm scared of flying, so let's just get out of the game. But the problem with that is that I've lost my car and it's in Canby Island and I've gone and got it back and it's a roasting hot day and uh, I said I'll tell you what I do with my mate who picked us up and took me to find my car I said let's let's have one on the way back eh? we'll have a drink on the way back uh, so I went into the pub and had several and uh, befriended <laughs> some other drinking people and they were having a barbecue. And I looked at my watch and it was like three-ish and I knew the flight was about seven at Heathrow. So oh, yeah, I'll come for a couple. So we went round and people were getting drunk and and I was getting drunk and uh, I looked at my watch and it was six o'clock and I'd actually left myself an hour to get from um, Billericay to Heathrow. I got in my car and I drove at about 100 miles an hour however fast I was going and lost control because I was drunk and crashed it and how I survived God only knows I put my seatbelt on I don't know why it was an era of my life where I never used my seatbelt police came and said have you had a drink which I thought was a bit hilarious because I couldn't hardly stand up um, the people that I, the house that I'd wrecked uh, the brick wall that I'd wrecked um, actually said do you want a drink and I just thought whiskey scotch brandy but I could see they probably went tea now, or coffee, but looking back I thought it was hilarious that they would offer me a drink, knowing the state of me, you know. The police came, took me to the cell. I was more concerned about doing what I had to do to get on the plane to go to Singapore, because I knew I was enormously late now. Uh, they took a breath test, and then they released me with um, Court Dale. I got in, my mate who'd followed me to the uh, police station, got me in the car, and... and driven me round the M25. As his teammates checked in at Heathrow and journalists got first reports of a sensational road accident in Essex, Tony Adams was once again travelling at high speed, bound for an uncertain future. Having gone from national hero to criminal via a brick wall, Tony Adams was driven to Heathrow in an attempt to join Arsenal's 1990 tour of the Far East. 
he missed the, the coach at uh, the stadium where we'd all meet up, meet up and go on a coach to uh, London Airport. And I thought we were actually going to go to Singapore without him because uh, you know, he was even late coming there and eventually turned out a bit worse for wear. A little glass in my hair still where I've had the car crash and I had flip-flops and my Arsenal uniform on and uh, that's it. I managed just to get them bits together and I got on a plane and they just, the directors were there, the chairman was there and George was there and they just absolutely, sh you know, ignored me. And I felt very low and very uh, enormously sad and, and alone. I didn't realise the seriousness of it when he was telling me. I mean, you know, when players tell you, especially to the manager, they, they tried to downplay it. He came and said, oh, we've got a court day of two days before Christmas or something ridiculous. And it was like, Tony Adams up for drink driving. There were fears that an example would be made of the soccer star. They were justified. He was jailed for four months. George Graham's fury was directed at the judiciary, not Adams. George was the most angry out of anyone when I was at the court. He really did go mad. He was very protective of me. Um, he hurt, you know, it hurt him as well. Everybody could see there the friends he had in court, so he was speaking on his behalf. Uh, but I think I feel, and I feel, what he speak to his lawyers a bit more. That's all I want to say at present time, OK? I thought the judgment was uh, more than harsh, extremely harsh, only because they were sending out a message uh, to everybody else, this is what's going to happen if we get any more drink driving prior to over the Christmas period. And there was a lot of other people telling me that I didn't deserve to be in there for what I did, and I'm not a proper criminal, criminal, and, and, and all this stuff, which, whether it's true or not, it doesn't really bother me today. The point of the matter is that alcohol, me abusing alcohol, got me into prison. Simple as that. Adams was sent to Chelmsford Prison. He served 58 days. And I was scared, and I was lonely, and I was in a cell. But I also had a lot of tools that made me a very successful footballer. And I used them. I played games, um, as in card games, um, <laughs> coin games, jokes, anything, you know, to avoid the way that I was feeling. It was a short, sharp shock, and it failed. It didn't stop me drinking. It wasn't a turning point. Yeah, it was pain, but it had me. Alcohol had me. I had to go a lot lower. There were those that called for Adam's dismissal, but George Graham stood by his captain, and within weeks of his release, his captain lifted the First Division Championship trophy. If you've got an Austin Morris and it breaks down, you throw it away. You don't throw a Rolls Royce away. You know, Arsenal ain't silly. You know, you're sitting on one of the best centre-halves of, of all time in, in English football. You know, and he breaks down, but you, you don't throw it away. Today, like many recovering alcoholics, Adams regularly attends sessions where addicts tell their stories. For ex-prisoner number LE1561, meetings of the Rehabilitation of Addicted Prisoners Trust have a special resonance. My name's Tony, I'm an alcoholic addict, and uh, it's really good to be here, actually. I feel, uh, feel OK. Um, and why am I here? Why am I here? Um, maybe because I don't want to pick up my drink or drug again, you know. Um, I don't want to get complacent. Uh, I've got a great life today and uh, um, it wasn't always that way. It was important uh, to me to go back into an environment like that, sober, basically, and to walk out of there sober and to see how it felt. Because I pretty much shut down when I went into Chelmsford and it's important for my recovery. Uh, oh, yeah. and to give back. I know what it feels like to be in prison and there's a lot of guys in there that have picked up a drink and found themselves in prison. I used to have so much self-loathing inside, it was horrendous, self-hatred. I used to smash bottles on me head like that. Mm. You know, I don't have to do that today. I don't have to do that today and that's all because uh, I uh, got saved a few years ago when some guy said to me, uh, do you fancy an AA meeting? and uh, I was willing and ready and beaten enough to accept it and, uh, and try to work a programme of recovery. And I'm, like I say, I'm really pleased that you've, you've given me the time to share my stuff and it, it keeps me well. Thanks very much.
When Adams went to prison in 1990, he'd just started a relationship. Not surprisingly, Jane Shea worked behind a bar. It's the only women I'm meeting, uh, relationships-wise, is when I'm drinking. And most of the time, I'm, 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 I'm drinking to excess. So how do you make, you know, when you've got all that, suppressing all the feelings around that, you know, how do you know if you're acting out of lust or acting out of love or acting out of, you know, whatever? Jane and Tony were married in July 1992. Always a man in search of a celebration, the groom drank heavily from breakfast time and was in blackout for much of the service and this reception. Today, he has this video in place of memories. Everyone's grounded, everyone's gone. Well, you and have a good time and get this. Marriage is another excuse when you're allowed to drink excessively. You know, in my head, I was, I was allowed to drink excessively, which was, you know, red, red rag to a ball. And uh, I went through it. It was a 12 o'clock wedding, and uh, I was drinking brandy at about 11 o'clock. And I can't remember the evening. That's what I did. The 1993 season was a good one for Arsenal. George Graham's methods were bearing fruit, and the back four of Adams, Bold, Dixon and Winterburn seemed impregnable. The Londoners took both league and FA Cups. Football was still Adams' first drug of choice, and it could keep him on the straight and narrow for up to 90 minutes. But by now, the drink was taking its toll on the 26-year-old captain. A year into his marriage, it was falling apart, and his baby son wasn't seeing enough of him. Nine years on, Adams is back where he started out as a boy, a windy playing field and a Sunday league semi-final. Oliver Adams is now the star. His father, just another voice on the touchline cheering for Felton Wanderers, making up for the lost years. Would the dangers inherent in the game stop you encouraging it? No, it's wonderful. They're innocent. You can see them here. They just uh, love every minute of it. And those kids love it. So no, no, if you want to. I, I'm really pleased that he's nothing like me, to be honest with you, not physically, but uh, the way he plays, you know, he's not interested in, uh, like I was, sitting at the, you know, I used to be at the back, kicking everyone. He doesn't seem to want to do that, he don't want to be at the back, which I'm kind of pleased with, really. So he's really dissimilar to me. Oliver. Did you have a chance? Yeah. With your head? Yeah. Short answers, I used to be like that. Did you? No. No, all used to go in now. Very sensitive. Dad, how much money do you get a day? <laughs> I don't know, mate. Enough. We've got enough. Do you get more than a thousand? Interesting. My kids are fascinated with money as well. Don't know if there's a good or bad thing. Daddy. What's that, baby? More than a thousand. Oh, I don't know. Got enough for food and stuff, haven't we? Yeah. We used to have a joke, Ray Parler and uh, me, we used to say, like, you know, we'd stand outside the hospital uh, waiting for people to, you know, have children so we can go and wet their baby's head. You know, it don't matter who it was. And uh, we'd say, oh, right, what's your baby called? Right, OK, thanks, right, great. And then we'd go and run to yeah. the pub and go, oh, this one's for Charlie, oh, this one's for... Yeah. There you go. Adams began his drinking career as a youth and sporting champs wants to reach out to young players like these in the Ipswich Town Academy before they're led into temptation. Spreading the word about damage to health and career, sporting chance education officer Peter Kay is on tour with Wolves star and recovering alcoholic Alex Ray, sober for three years. So addiction is a big word, it can cover what we're going to deal with mostly today as alcohol. But usually what we have found is that people who have become addicted to alcohol are also cross-addicted to other drugs. Alex is going to share with you as well some of his experience. Alex is a professional footballer who has lived what I'm talking about. I, I was just saying to Peter on the way down here, I thought, God, if somebody was coming in and I was about 17 or 18, and I was talking, talking about drinking, I'd have went bollocks, I know everything there is to know about drinking. And I think when I, when I look back, I got my first apprenticeship at, at Rangers and, uh, and that was at 16 and uh, even before then I used to like a good drink 
and I remember being in, a, in the nightclub at my first nightclub and I was with a few of the top players and I'm standing there and one of the senior guys who was pretty sensible came up to me and said to me, what are you doing here? I thought, I'm doing what the all you are doing. I didn't realise at that time that young boys weren't supposed to do that. And uh, within about 18 months I was getting kicked out of Ibrox as a young, a young lad and I was absolutely devastated as you can imagine because I, I know a lot of boys are under pressure. Uh, to, to get that first contract. And just by pure luck, uh, Falkirk, that big team in Scotland, came in and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they, offered, they actually offered us a few quid signing on fee. And my thought process was then was, I'll just go out and enjoy myself, because by that stage I was out run, jumping all the nightclubs and all that. Nothing had changed. I wound up in the Priory uh, just over three and a half years ago, and I was a total, total mess. Uh, Football-wise, my career's been pretty no bad. But uh, I often wonder what it really could have been like. In August 1996, when Tony Adams had finally faced a pint of beer he just couldn't stomach, he was alone in a bed wet with bitter tears, with nowhere to go and no one to turn to. I didn't know where to go or what to do. For some reason, I got in the car and went into work, even though I was injured. I went into work and was met with, by Paul Merson and a guy called Steve Jacobs in the car park, um, who I muttered the words to. Paul, I, I said to Paul, I said, Paul, I think I've uh, got a drink in my blood. And he said, join the club. You know, you can just come in the car park and say, oh, I've got a drink from them. You know, that's it. As soon as you say that, you're, you're there. You're there. You know, if you, as soon as you admit to yourself that you, you've got a problem, you know, you're three quarters of the way there. My experience of surrender was, I think, a, you could call it, it's only my explanation, but a spiritual, a, a religious thing, maybe. You know, I knew that I was beaten and I knew I couldn't get out. I knew I'd, you know, call it you know, my description again. Um, my end, my, my, I don't know where to go, um, my moment of clarity. You know, and I asked at a deep level of a higher power for help, and Paul Merson walked into my life. Merson was then football's most famous ex-drinker. He took his teammate to Alcoholics Anonymous, and within a month, Adams felt ready to come out to those around him. He faced them on the training ground. I'm Tony Adams, and I'm alcoholic. I think it was something to, to, that, to that effect, and walked straight off out, and we, we all just sat there dumbfounded. We, did, we hadn't got a clue. And it was like... Oh, we know you like a drink tone, but you know, you're not that bad. Um, but you could see in his emotional state that it, it was a real big thing for him to, to own up to it, his problems, and actually tell his teammates and, and that it wasn't just a, you know, I like a couple of drinks on a Tuesday. It, it was a real, real um, life threatening problem for him. Having told his teammates about his addiction, Tony Adams faced the press. Yeah, I'll tell you what I do. You've got two minutes. I've actually got to go and pick my kids up. Stand still, can you make me just... You no, all get together. All right. I'm doing it, not you. We're trying to make you look good. The sun's in the wrong place. Right, I'll, I'll give you two minutes, honestly. I've got to go and pick my kids up, so you've got two minutes. Okay, it's it's a, obviously a difficult day for you. Well, it's not just happened. Um, it's been a long time, and I'm on the road to recovery now. Um, it's not just happened overnight. I'd like to make that point clear. Um, how hard was it telling the other lads? Uh, to... That was a very big obstacle for me. Um, I'm not living a lie anymore, which is great. Feel a lot better for it. And it... how long did it take you to, um, to, to come to that decision? Tony? Twenty-nine years. <laughs> is Paul helping you at all? That, uh... Paul's been uh, fantastic for me. Uh, obviously, he understands me. He knows what I'm going through, and uh, he's been there for me. Yes. In the feeding frenzy that followed the announcement, reporters scrambled for their checkbooks. It's about me. And the moment I did that, it was like a, a shift inside. Something happened, you know, and I cried, and tears come out like tears of years <laughs> of. Uh, 
of hurt and sadness and loneliness and anger. Just feel like it all kind of came out. And it's probably the first time I've ever not got emotional with it actually, so in there, so time heals. And a lot of healing's gone on in the last five years. But it still hurts me and I have to hang on to it. And the reason I do is because I'm a human being and I forget. And if I forget that bottom, I'm going to think that I'm cured. I'm going to think that I'm okay. I'm going to think that I can drink again. And I, <laughs> it's the illness that tells you that you haven't got it. Which is baffling and cunning. I never actually knew the full extent of it until he came out and he came out of the, the closet, so, so to speak, about his drinking. I didn't know it was that bad until then. Nobody noticed he was an alcoholic. Do you find that hard to believe? Yes. Yes. Find that hard to believe because sometimes he tells me now, usually we had Wednesday off, but sometimes uh, he left Tuesday afternoon here, went to the pub and uh, came uh, to the training on the Thursday morning still drunk. So uh, maybe uh, people found that normal at the time. February 2002. A celebrity feast and a wax icon of an icon lure a well-heeled crowd to a chic London hotel. The gala dinner is the money spinner Tony Adams needs if he's going to make the charity work. Very odd how anyone would want that in the house, really, isn't it? <laughs> There's been much agonising about whining while dining, but it's been decided that in this culture and at this time, it's still hard to sell a gourmet meal without alcohol. This would do. Adams drinks water. Thank you very much. The first uh, auction prize up are David Seaman signed football shirt and gloves. I think we're starting at a thousand pounds, ladies and gentlemen. Thousand pounds. Someone give me three hundred pounds. Three hundred pounds. Thank you, sir. This is worth eight hundred to a thousand pounds, folks. Piece of that road. Three hundred. Four. Four two at the moment. Four four. Four four it is. Once, twice. Congratulations. You've got yourself a good time today. It's fine. This is the biggest so far, and it's the launch. And I always think that people are a little more reluctant to, when the when it gets established and people have heard about how good this one was. Mm. Then next year will obviously be a lot better. I would have thought. Mm. Um, but even so, so saying, it's still raised. I would say in the region of about forty thousand. That it's possible to organise a footballer's dinner in celebration of sobriety and have more than enough for a five-a-side match turn-up is a sign of the times. Inevitably, there will be some who feel a sense of loss if football's coming home from the pub. I was raised very much in a, an era that um, the saying was, win, draw, lose, must booze. And uh, it was very much a, drink, a, a, a drinking culture. And uh, you used to play the game hard and then drink hard afterwards. In every country you face a different problem. In England the problem was a drinking problem, but not only the players, I think the whole society had a drinking problem. So the, the football society only reflects the problem of a society. I think, you know, all of the teams were going out and drinking. You know, you'd go out somewhere and you'd see some players from another club and things like that. If you've done that now, I don't care if you're one of the best teams, you wouldn't finish anyway. Mm. You know, we come sixth, seventh or eighth every season. If we went out every week, we'd near on get relegated. My idea of getting the boys together in a different atmosphere today is maybe through psychology or through team meetings or, or go-karting or, you know, or, or numerous things. And I would have laughed, laughed at these things in the past and say, oh, what are you going down there? Let's go down the pub. I think it was quite strange for everybody because he was quoting poetry all of a sudden uh, and um, going to the theatre and going to Michelin starred restaurants and talking about all the Sloan girls and everything else that uh, Tone never spoke about and did. And yeah, I think he has a little laugh to himself these days about how he has changed. And some of the lads will look at him sometimes and say, you sure, Tone? I've never seen anybody change so much, ever, ever. 
The tape is long enough to describe how much he's changed. It's been, it's been a, fr a not frightening, it's the wrong word, phenomenal change from what he was like when he was drinking to the, towards the end of his drinking. And the change in him has been so big. I mean, he's a, he's a nice, he's a nice man. When they see Tony Adams out there playing football, they know that all the feelings that I go through, they're getting an honest, genuine person, you know, that wants to win for him, wants to win for his manager, wants to win for Arsenal, and wants to win for the sports. Winning the FA Cup and the Premiership in the same year was the crowning achievement of Adam's sober career and Arsene Wenger's new management. George Graham made Adams the player he was. Now the Frenchman had reaped the rewards. And it was so important if we go back and to do everything for me and for Arsenal and for the supporters and for, for the club to win the double. That was so important because they got the true me. They got me as a, as a human being. And I went through anger because we lost one week, you know, um, pain, uh, hurt, sadness, love, you know, all emotions that I was meant to go through over the course of that year and came away with the trophy of, yes, the double, but also of, you've done a good job there, well done. I don't regret the past. I feel that I've, I've come to the place where I am today because of it. You know, that, that everyone we meet, every place we go, every experience we have makes who I am today. You know, I pick up things and hopefully learn from things and move on. And I don't regret the past. It was, it was part of my process. And thank God I'm here today, you know, sharing it. I personally feel that he has gone through the most difficult period. I'm very confident that he will not uh, fall back, but uh, you never know in life. I don't know. Maybe I can start to drink tomorrow uh, for any reason. I don't know. You never know about yourself anyway. We are all always in danger or in a possible addiction problem. Football Stories returns in two weeks and the Channel 4 book Football Stories Bad Boys and Hard Men is out now priced at 9 99 To order, call 0870 1234 344 or click on to channel4.com slash shop. Well, next on 4, Monica's huge, Joey is really successful and Ross is on for a threesome. They're friends, but not as we know them.